Hey, Anchored listeners, Tom Brown the Third here. And we're here in the lovely, cloudy, beautiful Pacific Northwest. Uh, today, we're going to explore how to properly gather materials for, build, and maintain a fire uh, in a wilderness setting. Uh, we're also going to talk about some other concerns around fire, around safety, and just the proper usage of it. So I'm sure many of you out there watching this video could very easily build a fire when you have access to nice, dry seasoned firewood. Many of you may not have the confidence or the ability or the skill to build a fire in the wilderness with limited supplies and things that you gather directly off the landscape, especially if it's wet. Uh, so my goal with this short video is to provide you with some tips and tricks on how you can gather and process materials that you can find pretty much in any forest, in any weather conditions, and get a fire going that could, you know, very well save your life. All right, so uh, let's head off into the woods here. and Let's do this. So uh, when we're looking to build a fire structure out of things we gather off the landscape, our first and most important layer of that fire structure is gonna be our tinder. Now tinder is kind of defined as any dry, fibrous plant or tree material. Uh, and what makes tinder tinder is it has a lot of surface area. So if you only have one match or you, know, you wanna light a fire with one flick of a lighter, it's uh, important that we maximize the amount of surface area that that ignition source has. Uh, one of the great sources here in the Pacific Northwest especially, but you know, uh, these types of trees grow all over, is the cedar tree. And we can fairly easily scrape a good amount of tinder just off the outer bark of a cedar tree. And even though this tree is fairly damp right now, I'm gonna scrape it off, I'm gonna put it in my pocket, and as I get closer to building my fire, the body heat through my coat is gonna get rid of some of that excess moisture. And it's a really, really easy technique. All you really need is a knife. Uh, once again, anytime when we're in the woods and working with sharp tools, we wanna to be really careful. It's, uh, we don't wanna injure ourselves. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the blade of my knife and I'm gonna hold it perpendicular to the tree bark and my goal isn't to cut in and gouge into the tree bark. All I really want to do is just start to scrape it away. And fairly quickly, you can see how I'm already starting to collect some of this dry fibrous material here. So I'm going to scrape a little bit more. And then it's kind of an interesting game here of trying to catch it before it falls. I want to gather as much as I can. So I'll hold my hand under it. Every so often I'll pull my knife blade away, collect what I've scraped in my hand. And as I kind of get through that, that outer mossy layer, I'm just scraping away more and more layers. And the, and the deeper I get into that uh, outer bark, the drier it's actually gonna be. So you can see here in just a few seconds and not too many scrapes, I've managed to already create a fairly decent amount. So, you know, you do this for uh, a few minutes on any one given tree, you can have yourself a, a, a fairly large tinder bundle. On any tree, right, my goal here isn't to damage the tree too much. So I don't want to scrape from one spot any too much, you know, too much in any one spot. So I'll scrape a little bit here and I'll move down. I'll scrape some more. And this cedar outer bark, when this stuff is dry, this is gonna be just as good as any crumpled up piece of newspaper or toilet paper or whatever you might have that you would typically light your fires in the woods with. Uh, really important, as I said, uh, stuff in nature is wet, even if it hasn't been raining. And it, it's, it's been raining a fairly decent amount here in Oregon, but this stuff is still pretty damp. And in order to, uh, get this dry, my favorite method is I'm just gonna tuck this in my, my, my kangaroo pocket here. And as I walk, my body's gonna generate heat. It's gonna warm that up and dry some of that moisture out. So by the time I get to where I'm actually gonna build my fire and I've collected all my other materials, um, it should be dry enough for me to light it fairly easy with, uh, with, a, with my ignition source.
All right, so now we've arrived up at uh, a spot where I'm gonna be able to gather uh, one of the best and most awesome fire starting materials that is available to us in the wilderness. And this particular source is gonna be available anywhere where you have conifers. Uh, you know, when we think of coniferous trees, we think of that, that sap that's inside them. Uh, so what we have here is an old hemlock tree that has long since died and fallen over. And when the tree died, all of that sap kind of concentrates down into the stump. And you'll notice these kind of rib-like structures left behind. The reason why the rest of the tree is rotted and this hasn't is because this is super saturated with that sap. And that sap in this nursery stump is an important part for the next generation of trees uh, that are gonna grow out of it. So before you go into the woods around your house and cutting all of your, your conifer stumps down for this fire source, uh, please don't do that. You know, only really use this when you need to because it's really important for the forest to continue to grow and be healthy that these are left behind. So this uh, particular material is known by several names. It's called fat wood, fat lighter. Uh, a lot of times in hardware stores you can buy bags of sticks of it. Uh, for a ridiculously large amount of money. Um, but it's really easy to find and harvest, especially if you have conifer trees around. So you notice this is really wet. <clears throat> but what I'm gonna do, once again, I'm gonna take my handy knife, the most important tool in any survival situation is a good knife, and I am going to start to carve away the kind of outer layers of this. And you'll eventually see I will get to a layer that looks almost like cured bacon. And you see I've got to it right there. This right here. So I'm holding this in my hand right here. Let me stick my knife back in its sheath. So you'll notice that kind of cured bacon color. So, and if I smell that, it smells very strongly of pine salt, pine sap. Now I'm just gonna reach into my pocket here and grab my trusty Bic lighter and I'm gonna light this and you'll see why this stuff is so awesome. And keep in mind that this is wet with sap but it's also really wet with moisture. And once again, if I put this in my tinder pocket, uh, my body heat is gonna dry that out. So very quickly that flame from my lighter, now you can see it really start to go. So sap is, uh, very flammable. So you can see why even in the wettest of wet conditions, if you can find one of these stumps and find this uh, fat wood as they call it, uh, you are home free when it comes to building a good usable fire structure because the stuff is absolutely amazing. Uh, but once again, try not to take too much from any one spot. It's a good thing to have access to. But yeah, we always want to make sure our fires are out. But yeah, this is really, it's really awesome stuff. So, uh, earlier on when we were talking about uh, scraping the outer bark of cedar trees, I think I also mentioned that uh, certain trees, you can also use the inner bark uh, as a good source of tinder. Uh, inner bark is pretty self-explanatory. It lies underneath the outer bark of the tree and then on top of the actual wood of the tree itself. Now this maple here is a really good example of a really awesome tinder source. So you'll notice here on top, the outer bark is all peeled away because this tree's been down for a while. And with my hands, I can peel up this, these layers of inner bark. Now, yes, right now, this is absolutely very wet, but you know, using the heat of my body as I kind of walk around collecting the rest of my materials, uh, this stuff will dry out. And also, if you're uh, blessed with a sunny day and you gather a bunch of wet stuff like this, because it's so fibrous and thin, uh, just a few minutes and some open sunshine will really, really dry it out. Uh, remember, when it comes to tinder, the name of the game is surface area. I want as much uh, dry, fibrous surface area as I can get so that when my ignition source hits it, it's gonna, gonna, gonna make it go right up. And you can see, I just pulled a nice piece off right there. Uh, what I would do with this is I would continue, being that I want as much surface area as possible, 
is to continue to strip this out into smaller and smaller strips. And then once it dries, I might even take it in my hands and kind of fluff it back and forth. That's just really serving to break up those fibers uh, and give me that surface area that I need. <clears throat> so you can see here, just in a, a very short amount of time, I gathered a, a, a decent handful of inner bark tinder. And while this is wet right now, uh, a little bit later on, it'll be pretty dry and I'd be able to, I'll be able to light this up pretty easily. And especially, you know, even if it is still a little wet and I'm lucky enough to have some of that fat wood, um, that fat wood will dry this out as it's burning and then eventually this will burn. And it'll, it'll make more sense once we get to the actual construction of the fire structure itself. Inner bark is, is very good. A couple ways you can go about getting it. You can find a tree that's fallen down in the forest or you can find a tree that is uh, still what we call standing dead, meaning the tree is no longer alive, but it's uh, still standing upright. And I can use my knife to kind of peel away that outer bark and expose that inner bark. Fire is something that's very special to me. It's almost like a living being. Uh, you know, if you think about it, you know, think about a fire, right? It moves around, it, you need to feed it, it creates waste, it breathes. So to me, it's almost a living being. So I, I, I generally tend to treat it with a lot of reverence and respect and, and thanksgiving because uh, you know, the difference between having a fire, not having a fire could very well mean life or death, uh, depending on the situation. While it can be a, a super awesome tool that can help us do a lot of things, cook our food, give us light, purify our water, if we let it get out of control and we don't respect it, it can take over and take our life. So it's always important to be, be respectful and be safe. All right, so, so far we've collected tinder and we've collected some fatwood. Uh, and even though fatwood is not a dry fibrous plant material, so to speak, I typically do put it into the tinder category because it's gonna be, I'm gonna use it in the core of my fire to really heat up the other, the other materials. So the best and easiest way to remember the materials you need to collect are by naming them. And there's a few different ones. So after I've collected my tinder, uh, the next size material I want to collect is what I call pencil lead thickness. And we're gonna walk up here to this tree here in a, in a second and I will show you that. And so it goes pencil lead thick, pencil thick, finger thick, and then okay thickness. And then once you get to okay, you can just keep expanding how big, however big you want your fire to be. Uh, in all reality, as somebody who spent a lot of time around fire, people generally tend to build fires that are way bigger than, than, than needed. So we can get away with a lot of cooking and a lot of heat and a lot of light simply by burning stuff that's no bigger than that okay size or even finger size in some instances. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a walk up here and we will uh, start with collecting our, our pencil lead. So the first size material I wanna collect is the pencil lead thickness. Now keep in mind, these are approximate diameters, but basically what I'm looking for are these very small dead branches that are very thin. And my goal with this is to collect a lot of these. Remember what I said about building a fire, especially in inclement conditions, that surface area is paramount. I want as much surface area as I can get as I build my fire structure. Your tinder has a lot of surface area. Your bundles of pencil lead thick wood have a lot of surface area. And the type of fire structure I'm going to build uh, the way it works is the core is responsible for lighting the pencil lead thick wood. The pencil lead thick wood is responsible for lighting the pencil thickness wood. The pencil thickness wood is responsible for lighting the finger thick wood. So it goes by layers. So I go from most surface area to least. And it's a, a really awesome fire structure for that. When I'm collecting these pencil lead thick pieces of wood, I want to collect a lot of them. My kind of minimum I want to collect is I want to collect at least four bundles of these that are going to be a good handful because these are going to be the, um, the, the base of the structure of my fire structure. So I'm going to take a while, I'm going to find trees like this that got these 
low hanging branches with all these dead little twigs hanging off of them. And I'm just going to kind of go around skirting these trees, collecting as much of these as I possibly can. If my material does not snap, make a crisp snapping sound, and it just bends, if it's just bending, the chances are it's got too much moisture in it for you to work with. So I'm trying to find sticks that are going to snap right off. That means they're good and dry. You know, you can collect some, some, some bigger pieces as well, but I'm trying to keep all of these sizes kind of in the, in the same range as I go. So I'm just going to further move my way up the tree here. A side benefit to this is by removing a lot of these little dead branches, I'm also helping this tree a little bit. It's not going to have to shed them on its own and it's going to allow for some, some good new growth. So you can see in just a, in a really short amount of time here, and in just one little section, you know, I've already collected a, a, a pretty decent handful. Now I am going to want to have about four times as much of this as my base, especially if it's wet conditions. The drier it is, the less I can get away with. You know, in certain arid conditions, uh, you can build a fire with three or four sticks, but in wet conditions like here in the Pacific Northwest or in a lot of places throughout the world in the winter and the fall, when you have a lot of rain and snow and moisture, you're going to want to set yourself up for success as best as you possibly can. One other really important tip is that I never ever want to gather wood, especially this small stuff that is directly on the ground. Dry dead tree material and plant material is a sponge. And even just the ambient moisture that is in the ground in the earth itself is very readily absorbed by these small diameter materials. So that's why I'm trying to collect stuff that's up off the ground, that even though it's wet out, there's still airflow happening all around it. And this is gonna make it much easier. It's gonna have much less moisture in it. Uh, minimum for, especially for wet conditions, would be I want to collect about four times this. As I said, this uh, is going to be the foundation of my fire structure and it's going to be directly uh, on top of my tinder. So you can imagine, and you'll see when we get into the construction of the fire structure, you know, four bundles of this up over my tinder, that's going to be a lot of surface area. And the beauty about this stuff is, you know, even though there is a little bit of moisture in here, um, there's enough surface area here that when this, this takes off, it's gonna, gonna burn really quickly. So the next size I wanna collect is approximately pencil thickness. Um, once again, as I said earlier, I wanna try to collect stuff that is up and off the ground. So for instance, I got this branch here uh, it's dead and I can just really start snapping these branches off. As far as size go, when I'm building one of these fire structures, uh, typically I'm trying to break stuff into the 8 to 12 inch range. You know, there's no need to go lugging, uh, you know, three and four foot sticks back to your camp. But to get a good base fire going that I can then expand upon and once it gets going enough, essentially add any size log I want to, I like to keep it small. It makes construction of the fire structure itself that much easier. Uh, if it snaps, makes that clean snapping sound, I know it's dead and seasoned. You know, and you'll see as I get further up here, it might not be as snappy when I get to some of these branches. So like this one right here, that one's still good. Actually, this whole branch is good. So I'm just gonna, once again, as I go, Another thing you'll see in a lot of forests is a lot of these branches will have this green moss on it. That green moss is really wet. So as I'm collecting these sticks, I will also take a moment to kind of strip off some of that green moss. You don't have to get it all, but just helps you out a little bit uh, in the long run. I really don't need 
a ton. I don't need four good size bundles like I do with the pencil lead. So if I come to this one right here, you see this is nice and flexible and bendy, right? This is a live growing sapling. I want to leave this one alone. And instead I want to come over here to these branches that are going to snap off nice and crisply. Just because it snaps crisply does not mean it's completely devoid of moisture, but it's uh, what I'm looking for. If a branch has fallen off a tree and lands in the undergrowth and is still off of the ground, that is still, still good. It's still up off the ground. It's still got airflow uh, flowing all around it. During this process, I can also start to grab some stuff that's a little bit thicker into the finger diameter. And once again, these are all just kind of general sizes. I'm just looking to go from my tinder, which is my smallest, most fibrous layer, uh, all the way up to my OK size approximately, which is going to have the least surface area. If I see a good branch like this that is dead, I'm going to take this with me as well. And this is getting more into my OK thickness wood. So even though we build this fire structure in a specific order, doesn't mean we have to go out from our camp and collect pencil lead and take that back and then come back out and get your pencil size and take that back. We can multitask, we can stack functions. So first and foremost, one of the most important things with building a fire is safety. Uh, you know, I said earlier that fire can be a wonderful tool. It can also be cause a lot of destruction. So uh, we want to minimize our risks both to ourselves and to the forest around us. So there's a, a few things we need to consider uh, when, we, when and where we build our fires. The first thing I always like to do is look up. When I, find, when I found my place where I plan on building my fire, I like to look up and make sure there's no dead, low-hanging branches that you know, if a spark or an ember from my fire ends up in the, that branch could ignite the tree on fire. Uh, once again, it's really easy to do. So I always look up. I'm also looking up to make sure there's no you know, giant dead branches above my head that could fall on me sitting around my fire as well. So it's always good to look up. People very rarely ever look up. So yeah, so look for those low hanging branches that might catch on fire. Uh, I also want to look around the general area where I'm going to be setting up my fire. Uh, I want to make sure there's no dead shrubs or anything where, once again, an ember can blow across the ground and into something and ignite it. So we just really want to be safety conscious. You know, our goal is to keep us warm. Our goal is to give us light. Our goal is to cook our food. Our goal is not to burn ourselves in the woods down. So once I've selected my site, the next thing I want to do is I want to clear away all debris in a, in a good six foot circle at least around where I'm going to build my fire. Uh, you know, especially leaf litter. Even if the leaf litter is wet before you start, by the time my fire gets going, it's slowly going to dry out around it. And dried leaves are a wonderful ignition source. So I want to take the time to really clear that stuff away uh, before I build my fire ring. In approximately a six foot circle, imagining my fire is in the center, I want to clear away all leaves and debris. So here's where you get down on your hands and knees and you really just start kind of using your hands to clear away. You want to be careful with this. Uh, in certain places there are, could be poisonous plants. There might be sticker, you know, uh, uh, briars and things like that. So just be mindful of that. If you want to expedite the process a little bit, you can get yourself a flat stick. And I can use this to kind of, as a rake, so to speak, to kind of clear some of that away. Sometimes your hands work good. Sometimes you can use the stick. But I just want to make sure to get the majority of them. Uh, you know, we need to remember that water flows downhill and water always seeks its own level. So just like you wouldn't set up your tent 
at the bottom of a depression in the ground, you also don't want to build your fire in a depression in the ground. So there's a saying out there when it comes to fire building and shelter building as well, uh, high and dry. So I want my fire structure to be in an area that's a little bit higher than what's around it. Um, so we are in a bit of a downslope here, water's gonna flow downhill, but if I build my fire up on this little raised section here, uh, I should be good. So yeah, avoid building your fire in a super low lying spot. Just wanna clear a bit more away. How much space you clear depends on the size of the fire you're gonna be building. You know, as I said earlier, people tend to think they need a lot more fire than they actually do. So the fire I'm gonna be building uh, is gonna be relatively small. So if I was planning on building a giant cooking fire, I would clear out a lot more of this, these leaves and debris. But for this small fire, just need about this six foot or so radius. So what I'm gonna do now is I wanna further uh, contain my fire. So I'm gonna take my handy digging stick here that I gathered from just over there, and I'm gonna dig a small depression in the ground. Once again, this is just gonna be further to contain my fire. Another use of this, uh, in certain places, you can cause what's known as a root fire, where basically that same sap that is in the fat wood that I'm gonna use as part of lighting this fire is concentrated in the roots, and your fire on the ground can actually get that sap superheated and cause it to burn underground. So in this area, I'm not too concerned about it, but in a, in a very heavy conifer forest, I might be. So I would also use this time where I'm digging this depression to seek out any roots and sever them and remove them so I don't cause a root fire. And I'm not trying to fling this dirt off into the wilderness because when I'm done with this area, when I'm done with this fire, it is my job uh, as a human and a caretaker to return this area back to the way it was before I came. And by saving and maintaining this dirt, once my fire is extinguished, I can put the dirt back, I can rake the debris I raked away back, and I can try to return the area to the way it was before I came. If everybody did that every time they went into the woods, the world would be a much better place. Gonna dig a little bit more, I'm not trying to fling that dirt. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add one more layer of safety to this one more layer of protection, and I am going to build a rock ring. Once again, the rock ring, uh, its primary purpose is going to be to contain the fire. However, rock rings have a secondary purpose. They store that heat energy. And once these rocks get a certain amount of thermal mass, if that fire goes out, these rocks can still continue to radiate heat. So if I'm ever, ever forced to sleep around an open fire and in the middle of the night, or if I purposely put my fire out before going to bed, these rocks are still gonna radiate heat and can keep me warm. And I am just gonna kinda go around and create a barrier that the fire should not be able to escape. You can, on the opposite side of the fire you plan on sitting from, you can actually build a taller rock wall that will act as a fire reflector, right? So the light from that will be reflected back towards you off of that rock wall. So it's another good little technique to maximize your warmth and your light off of your little tiny fire. Try to fill in all the holes. I can use the excess dirt that I have to fill in some of those gaps as well. And with a little bit of work, I have made this that much safer for the fire I'm gonna build. Um, as you can see, we've cleared out a good diameter around, dug a little bit of a depression, and we got our fire ring. You know, once again, it's always best to be safe. Uh, here, ever so nicely, I have uh, got things laid out in the kind of sizes we're gonna go for. Uh, now this, structure. It's got many names. We can call it the tent structure. We can call it the triangle structure. Uh, but basically, uh, it is going to be kind of pyramid shaped. And the reason for that 
is it is going to shed water and you'll see as I build this. Uh, and I'm going to build it from the ground up. So our first layer is going to be our tinder. And I remember our tinder is our super dry, fluffy, fibrous material that has a lot of surface area. After we put our tinder down, we're then going to move on to our kind of pencil lead size and then go up as we go. And eventually it's going to resemble, you know, a triangle or a pyramid. The really awesome thing about this fire structure is if it's built well, it sheds water. And the water will shed off the outer sticks and the inside will still be dry. I've actually built these structures and purposely left them out in the rain uh, and had the next day the core tinder bundle still be dry. In some places, if I had access to a nice dry piece of bark, I might put a dry piece of bark down on the ground here first to keep my tinder from absorbing moisture. But seeing how everything around here is pretty wet uh, and the soil that I dug down into is actually fairly dry, I'm going to go ahead and just place my, my tinder bundle uh, directly on the ground. But if you have access to a piece of dry bark, uh, it might be good sense to do that. This is from a cedar tree and once again really good tinder source. I can just take and I can shred this up into little bits and give myself that surface area. And I've already got some that's more fully prepared over here but I just wanted to point that out really quick and remind everybody that inner bark is another great source for tinder as well. So we're ready to get started here and I'm going to start by placing that tinder bundle that I collected earlier right in the center there. And I've also got, once again being that I have access to the resource in this area, I've got some of this little shavings of fat wood that I'm also going to kind of incorporate into this. This stuff is a blessing if you have access to it. But remember, as I said earlier, don't, don't overuse it. So what I like to do is I like to separate out my pencil lead thick sticks into okay size bundles. This makes building this structure that much easier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get right in my fire structure and I'm going to try to Just going to kind of put these first two bundles down like so. I'm going to grab the third one, come around the side. And one thing you want to make sure of is that there isn't much of a gap between your tinder and the bottom of your sticks. So I want to make sure that my tinder, and I'll actually fluff it up and push it up into into the sticks a little bit. I want to make sure my tinder is touching my pencil lead thick uh, material because if I light that and the tinder burns away before it catches, uh, then most likely my fire is not going to get going. So now I've got this other bundle which I'm just going to kind of break down a little bit and just kind of fill in some of these spots like so. And I've got a little extra for my next fire. So what I want to do now is move on to my pencil thick wood. Now this stuff I'm not going to place in large bundles like I did the pencil thick, but I might just place kind of three or four sticks at a time. And I want to be sure as I'm doing this to not knock this over as I go. I'm just going to kind of place some there place some there. It's, a fairly, it's fairly sturdy already, but it could still be knocked over if I'm a little careless with it. I always find that building a fire structure is kind of like making a sculpture and no two are ever alike. <clears throat> and I always enjoy the challenge of uh, building a fire with new material types and new conditions. So just moving up sizes as we go. As I go bigger in size, I will place less of them at a time. So you can see now I'm literally placing one stick at a time now. One very important thing 
is that we want to make sure when we are building this that we leave a doorway where we can access our tinder bundle. Because if I build this structure 360 degrees around my tinder bundle, how am I going to get my ignition source in there? So uh, I've made the mistake not paying attention in the past and done that. Uh, don't make the same mistake that I've made in the past. Make sure you leave a little net. doorway into the center of your fire. And you'll see here in a minute before I light this what I'm talking about. Kind of keep adding wood as you need. You could get all the way up to burning 16 inch diameter trees if you needed to. But yeah, one of the one of the great things about a little fire like this is uh, it's really easy to maintain. Um, typically it's going to be pretty smoke free. Um, because this wood is a little damp, it's going to give off a little bit of smoke. People think they need this giant roaring fire to survive and it's just not the case. You can really really get it, really do it with a small one. Uh, we've built our fire and lit our fire and we've accomplished uh, whatever task we needed the fire for, whether it's to warm us up or purify some water or, or cook a piece of meat. And we are ready to break camp and move on. And as I said, you know, as, as caretakers of the planet, it's our job to try and leave areas better um, than when we found them. Uh, and from the danger standpoint, before I leave a fire, I want to make sure that it's out. You know, I do not want to set the woods on fire. That is not my goal. So you can see that this is burned down fairly well, mostly to the kind of white uh, ash. And what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to kind of rake it all out a little bit, just kind of spread it out. It's an order of fire to burn, you know, it requires fuel on top of fuel to keep it going. So by raking it out, I'm kind of dispersing the heat. And then, luckily I've got my trusty bucket of water handy here. Uh, I'm going to take this and I'm going to dump it on the fire. Uh, water management can be crucial in a survival situation, so it might not always be the wisest to dump what little water you may have on the fire. Um, you can also urinate on your fire. Uh, that's one, one potential option. If you're near a creek, you can transport water that way. However, if you do not have access to water and do not have to pee, uh, the goal is to let your fire burn out as much as it possibly can and then at least cover it with some dirt and really make sure it's out. But here, lucky, we have access to water. So I'm just going to take and instead of just kind of dumping it all in one spot, I'm going to kind of I'm going to kind of spread that water out a little bit. I'm going to create a little charcoal soup here. Now, fire is such a, a tenacious thing that if I left this just these few burning pieces, uh, there is a potential for that to ignite. But luckily, in the construction of my fire ring, I've also saved this dirt. So my next step in returning this area back back to the wilds as possible is I'm going to start just kind of scattering these rocks I collected back out onto the landscape. If I pulled any rocks that were buried deep in the ground and the spot is close by, I will try to replace that rock where I got it from because that rock may have been habitat uh, for insects or other small critters. And I want to respect their homes as well. Remember, my goal is to leave no trace. You know, I want to leave the area camouflaged and almost as if I had never been there. I've got all this dirt that I dug out from the middle. So I'm going to take this dirt and I am going to pat it over my fire. Another pro tip in very cold areas, you can build yourself a, a fire in a trench that's about as long and as wide as your body. Uh, 
and you can do this same thing. You can cover it over with a good layer of dirt and sleep on top of that and that'll keep you warm for quite a little while. And now I'm just gonna go back over to some of this wet leaf litter that I collected and I'm just gonna try to camouflage this area back. All right, you can see with just a little bit of work and a little bit of water uh, in just a very short amount of time, I was able to pretty much disappear this whole fire. Uh, I would probably still continue to do a little bit more work uh, before moving on, but I'm not seeing any smoke coming up through, uh, through the dirt. So I would consider that fire to be safely put out.